Well, guys, I'm glad that we're here, uh, and I'm glad that we're looking at the Word of God today. There's nothing else that can fill and satisfy our souls like the Word of God. And so let's feast on it. But before we do that, if you could pray with me. Father, you know our needs. You know the empty places in our heart that need filling. You know the things in our minds that need to be straightened out. And Lord, I pray that you would do your perfect work in us this morning, that as your word comes, that it would bring faith and encouragement, reproof, training in righteousness, all of the things, Lord, that you promise. We pray that you would have them here in us. Because we're not perfect, Lord. We're not anywhere near it. When we look at Jesus, we see perfect. And we're not there yet. So, Lord, as we look at your word, we pray that you might feed us. We think about the world outside this place. Think of Afghanistan, those who are brothers and sisters who are suffering persecution because of the name of Jesus. Pray, Lord, you give them special grace. Pray you move in the hearts and the minds of the people in our government to make right choices to save those who have been left behind. Lord, we pray for our own souls and those who are alongside us here today. I pray, Lord, that you might make us more like you in every way. That we might see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've been watching the news, you know the world has gotten worse. <laughs> We've got COVID numbers going up, and there are people that are not here because they're wondering if they have it or not, and so they're staying away. And thank you to those of you who did that, and uh, pray that the Lord give a special blessing upon you and watch over you as well. But we're here, and I don't want to mess this up. So... We are in the book of Luke, chapter 6. We're going to finish the end of it. I titled this Trees and Rocks because it was simple. And I'm a simple kind of a guy. Trees and Rocks. It says in Luke 6, 45, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's out of the things that are going on on the inside of us that the words come out of our mouth and come outside of us. How many of you have realized that you said things that are detestable? Any, any? Oh, that's good. Okay, so it's not just me. Good. That's most of you. That, that's really good. The rest of you need to teach us. <laughs> so we're going to talk about trees and rocks. It's, it's about living like Jesus. Remember, Jesus is giving this sermon to his disciples. So that is completely applicable to us. So as we look at it, he's not talking to the world. He's talking to his disciples. We looked in the beginning of chapter 6 where Jesus taught on the Sabbath. His disciples were eating on the Sabbath, and he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The, the religious leaders had it all backwards. And he healed a man on the Sabbath as he was in the synagogue, which they looked down upon because they considered that work. But it really is God working, isn't it? Yes. Hmm. And Jesus said, my father works to this very day, and so I work. Amen. And so... What's so wrong about working on a Sunday? I work on Sunday. <laughs> we were in verses 12 to 26 of chapter 6, and we saw Jesus choosing the disciples, but before he did that, he prayed all night. I don't know when it was you last did that, but it's quite an exercise to go all day and then go all night and then go all day. And Jesus did that because he had some important choices to make, and he chooses the disciples, and of course, they're named in this section here, and he begins to teach them. This is called the Sermon on the Plain as opposed to the Sermon on the Mount, although a lot of it is exactly word for word, which tells me sometimes Jesus repeated himself. So I don't feel so bad. <laughs> Living like Jesus. And last week we talked about judging and loving. 
Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you and those who despitefully use you, uh, give to the one who asks of you. So we went through all of those, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth, blessed are the meek. So we went through all of those things that Jesus was talking about. And we saw he wasn't just talking about financially rich, but people who, who are Listen, I know enough, I don't need to know anything more about your Jesus. You know, I'm good enough the way I am sort of mentality. And that's, that's just wrong because uh, we always need to learn. You can learn from a child. I know I have. But we talked about loving and judging about how we can have a big giant mass of things in our lives that aren't right and yet find the smallest speck of something in someone else's eye and then think we are qualified to go and dig it out. Of course, we're just not. And so the the two things I kind of came up as a summation is let's get busy loving people, which, you know, is a deep commitment to another's best good. That's what love is. It's a deep commitment to another's best good. It's not a feeling. It's not romance. It's not hearts and flowers and chocolates. It's a commitment to another's best good. And so today we're going to talk about what it is to live like Jesus and Jesus explains some things in some real fundamental ways that we can understand and kind of put a handle on. He begins in verse 43 and he says, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit for every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs of thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, it could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. So it's a simple six verses that we're going to go over here. But the very simple teaching that Jesus teaches us has some big implications for our lives. And so uh, I would ask you to consider it. You've probably read through this before and maybe you've even studied it. Or maybe just on the first viewing you go, well, that makes sense. Trees and rocks, I get that. No problem. A good tree does not bear bad fruit. So if there's bad fruit in your life, if there's things coming out of your life that are bad, you got to start questioning whether that's who you are. That's what he's talking about. And a bad tree does not bear good fruit. In other words, somebody who is completely selfish isn't going to do unselfish things. It's inconsistent with who they are. For every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. So my question to myself is first, am I a good tree or am I a bad tree? Well, Jesus says you can tell from the fruit. You can tell by the things that are going on in your life. What's, what's hanging on the outside of you? What, what is it that you occupy your time with, your hours, your days, your months, your years? What is it that's a priority to you? And would people be able to see that? For instance, if they opened up your checkbook, where, you know, what are you, what are you taking care of? Basically everything for yourself and nothing for anyone else or are other people involved in that? So finding out if you're a good tree or a bad tree is one of those things. I, whenever I think of a bad tree, I think of this guy. <laughs> if you remember in the Wizard of Oz, they were walking through the, the woods and they went to pick up an apple and the tree smacked, you know, Dorothy's hand and she's like, ow, you know. Why are you picking up my why are you picking up my apples? You know, oh well, they're probably rotten anyway. And the bad tree just started throwing rock, throwing uh, apples at them, and then they had a whole bunch. So, it's reverse psychology. But that was a bad tree. Don't mess with my stuff. Don't touch my stuff. Although I, I feel free, I could throw it at you and, and hurt you with it. That's okay. 
that would be a bad tree. And so I always ask that question, did I do a bad thing or am I a bad tree? Because sometimes there are things that shouldn't be in my life. And sometimes I wonder, I wonder if any of you ever question whether you've had an encounter with the living God through Jesus Christ. Has the Holy Spirit really come inside of me? Do I, am I really saved, a saved person? It's one of those things that uh, I tend to get in, entangled in when I'm not living right or I'm not doing what I should be doing. It's never when I'm reading the word. <laughs> it's never when I'm doing the right thing. It's always when I haven't done the right thing and I start questioning and the devil gets on my shoulder and says, you're a dirty, rotten so-and-so. You're no different than you've ever been. And if your congregation only knew what you thought and well, you guys probably don't have those troubles, but I do. <laughs> So a good tree bears good fruit. And, and believe it or not, there are good trees and there are bad trees. Um, there are trees that you don't want to continue propagating. Uh, I call them weeds. <laughs> and then there are, there are trees that you want to propagate, like those that bear fruit that you can actually eat. Or, you know, corn, if, you're, if you have corn, corn's going to be coming up soon. But you probably have a million tomatoes if you planted tomatoes. All of these things coming up out of the ground, these are the things you want to keep planted. It's not all of the other things that uh, tend to grow there all on their own without your helping them. So there's some bad fruit, and you, you don't get bad fruit from a good tree. Um, it, it could be that a piece of fruit gets infected by an insect or something of that nature, especially if you have those crazy flies that are out now. But this is what Jesus is talking about, something that they could relate to because just about everyone Jesus was speaking to was agrarian. They were growing things. They were either herding animals and growing things or they were growing things. Uh, so these folks would understand about that. You and I don't necessarily have fruit trees, so we don't get that. But Jesus says the fruit is going to tell you what kind of tree you have, just like our behavior is going to tell you what kind of a person you are. Um, it's, it's very easy to get to know somebody by writing letters and long distance and phone calls and all that. But as soon as you spend time with them and they're with their friends or out in a social setting or with their family, you're going to get the, a real well-rounded picture. Uh, you know, Facebook is one of those dangerous things. You know, you think you know somebody or you think, oh, I have 4,000 friends. They're not really your friends. It's right. just not... Jesus is saying that you don't gather figs from thorns. But, so there are some people who are thorns and they don't produce fruit. There's not going to be any fruit there. It, it, it's what happens when a Christian tries to tell a non-Christian, you know, you need to be good and do good things. You, if, you're a, if you're a bramble bush, you're not going to produce any fruit. You're going to make a lot of thorns and you're going to make a lot of people bloody and unhappy and you know, you're going to get burned down at some point in time. But this is... It's impossible to get fruit from somebody that can't produce fruit. It's impossible to get fruit from a thorn bush. Sometimes we have very high hopes for people that they will do well and perform better and, you know, do good things and stop getting over their selfishness and stuff. You have absolutely no right to hope that somebody that doesn't have a living relationship with God of heaven, that it just isn't going to happen. So don't squeeze them because they're, they're not going to produce anything because you're expecting to find something on the inside that doesn't appear on the outside, which never happens. There are not coconuts that look like limes. They're just, they're not. They, as cr much as you might try to crossbreed it and get yourself a nice pina colada flavored something, it's just not going to happen. And so we tend to do this for people. But the fruit of the Spirit, what comes out of somebody who has had an encounter with the living God through Jesus Christ, is first of all, love. And then all of the others are kind of descriptive of that. The fruit of the Spirit, notice it's singular of the Spirit is love, which includes joy, peace, long-suffering. That's what you do. You suffer long when you're a fruit-bearing tree. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if you're a good tree, your job is to bear fruit. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing more exciting than doing what God's enabled and strengthened us to do. 
because there was a time when I didn't know Jesus Christ, when I didn't know forgiveness, when I was not free, where I didn't understand grace. Now I do. And because of that, I want to share. I want to bear fruit for other people. I want to be suffering long. And that's the way it should be. Not that it's easy, but God gives us the strength. He's the one who enables us to do that because he makes us into a good tree. Otherwise, you're just trying to get blood from a stone. You, you, you've probably heard that statement. I, I don't wonder that may have come out of this <laughs> scripture, although there's no stones or blood. You can't get blood from a stone. You can't make something that does not have blood in it give you blood. It just won't happen. So, you know, I can't expect all of New Jersey drivers to obey the law. I just can't do it. <laughs> this is what I preach to myself, okay, because... Otherwise, I'll have no compassion. The Bible says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart brings forth evil. Well, this, this, you could teach this to a Sunday school class, right? Good people do good things. Bad people do bad things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks... So he's not just talking about being a good tree and bearing good fruit. He's saying there's something about our behavior and our conversation that will reveal who we are. So if, if you have a problem with your behavior or your speech, I don't know about you, but I tend to question my commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ when that happens. So my behavior and my conversation is going to tell you who I really am. It's not who I am on Facebook. It's... It's who I really am. What do I actually do with my time, with my talents, with my treasures? What do I do with my words and how do I use them? What, what's the attitude that I have? That's who I really am. It's interesting because it says here in Jeremiah 17, 9, you probably all know this passage. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So Jeremiah is making a pronouncement that everyone has a wicked heart. So how is it that Jesus says, out of a good heart, a good man produces good things? How can it be that everyone has a deceitful heart, and yet Jesus says there are some that have that, but some that have a good heart? Well, how do you get to going from having an evil heart to having a good heart? Well, you just work at it, right? You have to be good, be good enough, and try harder, read a lot of books, um, you know, just keep repeating things to yourself in the mirror like you're good enough, you're smart enough, and everyone loves you? No! And don't you ever quote me on that. The Bible talks about a process, and here in Ezekiel 18, it says, cast away from you all the transgressions in which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. In other words, you need to get your heart right. Don't worry about your behavior. Your behavior comes out of your heart. You need a new heart. So get yourself a new heart and a new spirit, because I take no pleasure in cutting you down and taking you home and standing in front of me and being judged. I take no pleasure in that. So get a new heart and get a new spirit. So that's the encouragement. And then he says later in Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart. This is God speaking in response. And put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So how do you bear good fruit? It's asking God for a new heart. It's asking God for a spirit. Or else what you're left with is this, this deep, desperate, dark heart that you don't even know how deep it goes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's not just that you and I as saved human beings are walking around with a desperately wicked heart. Certainly it needs to be tuned up. Certainly we need sanctification. But I, I now have a new heart. I now have a new mind. I now have a new spirit because God gives it to me through putting my faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross and nothing else. There's nothing else I can do but give up and say, God, you got you to change my heart. I need, I need a, a, a trans, transformation in here. 
and I will put my spirit within you to cause you to walk in my statutes. By the way, don't boast about how great you're doing because it's only the spirit of God that changes you from within that causes you to be able to do that. And you will keep my judgments and do them. So out of the goodness of a good man's heart, he brings forth good things. So uh, the, the scripture uh, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. It's, it's interesting. I used to think it was the other way around. You know, where your heart is, where your desires are and the things that you want, that's where your money goes. Well, that makes sense. But Jesus put it the other way around. He said, where your money is, that's where your heart is. Right. So if you want to see where somebody's heart is, what are they investing in? Are you investing in the kingdom of God? Are you investing in the lives of other people? Are you investing just in your own comfort, in your own happiness? So what are you investing in? So that's a question that I ask myself. Where am I putting my money? Am I putting my money into the kingdom or am I putting my money just into this world? And uh, so there's an assessment that I have to make of myself. It says in James 3.13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. If there's anybody who's really committed their life to Jesus Christ, you're going to see it by the way that they conduct their lives. And James gives us this encouragement that we should be doing it in the meekness of wisdom. It didn't come from some kind of a proud heart, some kind of a boasting heart. It comes from the meekness of wisdom, uh, much like when Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. It shouldn't be a published thing. It should be something that you do as a sacred thing before you and God. And it's, uh, and I never have to worry about that here because all of our bills are paid and we have a building. Amen. And it wasn't because we saved up a million dollars to buy it. Thank God. So, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, well, that tells me why I say the things that I say. How many of you have trouble with your mouth? Okay, less brave people. Okay. Yes, I've had years of learning all sorts of things. In fact, I know Spanish, but it's not the kind of Spanish that I would tell you because I know all the bad words in Spanish. I know colors and numbers and stuff like that, but I know all of the curse words because I have researched these things through experience. Uh, <laughs> why couldn't I apply myself to something else? Well, because I was a bad tree and I was collecting the bad fruit of other people. But our language says something about it. In fact, uh, this is how Matthew takes the Sermon on the Mount here in chapter 12. He says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Just like what we see here, Luke says. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of in the day of judgment. That means when you say something and you don't mean it. When you say, I'll see you at church at 10 o'clock and you don't show up. <laughs> or I'll I'll be there tomorrow, or I'll... It's when you say something and it doesn't happen. It's an idle word. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't produce anything. Um, and I, I, I get to the place where I, like, hyper-analyze myself, and I start thinking, well, when I say good morning, do I really mean good morning to people, or is it just a way of breaking the ice? When I say how are you, do I really care how they are, or am I just saying that because it's a thing you say? How are you doing? Do I mean that? Or is it an idle word? Is it just, hey, how you doing? Like, I, I'm busy. Stay with me, you know. Um, so I hyperanalyze. I'm sorry. I've gone into self-therapy right in front of you, but <laughs> I will have to give an account for everything that I say. Every idle word. That's how important what comes out of your mouth is. But it's important that your heart's right first. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Just like I can identify an apple tree very easily when there's apples on it. Say, that's an apple tree. You're a genius, Dave. You know, that is an orange tree. How do you know? There are oranges on it. It's not hard. But this is a little more difficult because people tend to be a combination of things, don't they? It's not just good. Sometimes people can breathe out fire on you. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Maybe you're not married. 
Wow, I said that. So you get close enough to somebody, you get to see really what's going on in the inside. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. That's why a lot of people don't have intimate relationships with other people because they're afraid that they'll see what's going on in the inside. But not you good people. <laughs> James has a lot to say about the tongue. He says, my brethren, by the way, notice his audience. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Why is that? Because the things that come out of your mouth get picked apart. Trust me. For we all stumble in many ways. I love that he says that. If anyone does not stumble in a word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. By the way, this word perfect means mature, well-rounded. It doesn't mean perfect like perfectionistics take it to be perfect. If you can control what comes out of your face, you can control anything. Yeah. I can control what goes into my face in the way of caloric intake. <laughs> if I can control what comes out of my mouth. I can control my temper. I can control my driving. I can control everything if I could just control my face. He's a perfect man able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us. It's interesting, we use the mouth. And we turn the whole body. Look also to ships. Although they are large and they're driven by fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And the question is, who's the pilot of your mouth? Even so, the tongue is a little member and it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? All you have to do is go look to California and all the fires they have out there. Forget how many, how many miles of property are burning out there. All started by one spark. For the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and it sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. All you have to do is turn the TV on and listen to the war of words. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea has been tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, notice his audience, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter at the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. And so if we say that we're followers of Jesus Christ, that needs to be indicated in our speech in what we say, in how we say it, in the motives in which it's made. And of course, that has to go back to our heart and what's going on inside of us and then what happens in our mind. Whether we're going to do those things that Jesus says or not do those things that Jesus says. And we have that choice. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? That's a really good question. Because when we say that, it's just words. Like worshiping this morning, it could have just been that we got together to sing because, my goodness, you turn the radio on and you sing to all kinds of songs and you have no idea what you're singing. And suddenly words are coming out of your mouth. It happens to me. It's why I don't turn the radio on. Because I, I know the words and I know the song. And suddenly I'm singing trashy lyrics. I'm like, oh, my Lord, I'm sorry. I'm going to be judged for that, aren't I? I better cut that out. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you who he's like. Jesus is going to give us this parable. And in another place in Matthew 7, he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who's in heaven. You see, it doesn't matter what you call Jesus. It matters how you respond to Jesus. Right. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That, that's a pretty big deal. Cast out demons in your name? Uh, I don't even have that on my resume. <laughs> and done many wonders in your name? I, I'm not quite there yet. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Never knew you. 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So is it possible to cast out demons and do wonders in the name of Jesus Christ and still practice lawlessness? Yes. You can be a, a, a make-believer right. instead of a true believer or an unbeliever. Hypocrisy is one of those things that people tend to cover up with doing good things and they think they've done a good thing and it's good enough, but giving somebody a cold glass of water in a burning building is not nearly enough and because it doesn't involve sacrifice. But somebody who's a good tree will produce good fruit and it won't be a hypocritical sort of just on the exterior uh, so people can see. Most people put on multiple faces for whatever it is they think other people want to see. And that's not who Jesus wants us to be. You folks know I am not the most eloquent person on the face of the planet. I am not the, the tightest communicator. I am not the most well-learned scholar. I'm just the dude that got saved. And Jesus tapped me on the shoulder and said, I'd like you to tell other people about it. I don't have to pretend. And I'm glad for that. And I'm glad you guys don't want me to. Well, you know, if you could speak more like John MacArthur, I think you'd have a larger audience. <laughs> if you'd only use that radio announcer voice more often. <laughs> you know, slim down by about 40 pounds and wear cool things and, you know, go do shots with the boys on occasion. And I'm sure you could grow this church, brother. You know, anyway. There are people that say these things. I, I just changed channel. In James 1, to 25, I, I was kind of on the James kick. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. By the way, no one else is fooled but you. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and he goes away and he immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I don't know about you, how many of you looked in the mirror this morning? Predominantly female. Yes, that's what I thought. <laughs> or very conscious. Very good. Marbu looked in the mirror. He's, he's, his, his wife told him to. <laughs> My wife doesn't do this. She just looks at me and says, something on your face. So, I get it, mommy. I'm cool. Tell me what I need to do. But you know, we tend to look in the mirror and see what we want. But then, that's me, with a filter on. If you have Snapchat, you can do that, and you can take pictures of yourself where you look completely different than the way you really look. I, I'm fascinated, this is like a new little toy. I don't talk to anybody on Snapchat, but I use the filters. I'm like, oh, oh that's hilarious, look at that. Look, that's me. <laughs> That's how I see myself. I see myself as a kid. Do you see yourself that way? You can fast forward and it'll filter and it'll make you gray. I mean, it'll take wrinkles out or make wrinkles, you know, or it'll take all your hair off if you're thinking about. But we tend to look in the mirror and see what we want to see. You can look in the mirror and you can be filled with self-hatred. Or you can look in the mirror and say, oh my God, you've gotten old. Or, oh my God, you've gotten fat. And which is what I pronounce on myself all the time. But you see, what Jesus sees is what we do. Because this life is going away. This exterior is, is on its way out. Because it's an outdated model. And we're all going to become worm food if the Lord doesn't take us home. And so that's okay. The question is, is your life full of meaning? Is it full of purpose? Is it full of fruit? Are you doing what the Lord has called you to do? That is what brings fulfillment, not what you're going to see in a mirror. Right. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I'll show you the one who does the will of my father that, that does what I'm telling you to do. I'll, I'll tell you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and he laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, he could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Amen. Now I'm going to ask a trick question, and I'm sure none of you will answer. The rock in this picture is what? 
See, it's a trick question. Because he answered it previously. He says, the man who hears my sayings and does them, I will tell you what he's like. He's like the one who built his house on the rock. So the rock is actually doing what Jesus says. It's actually doing. I know I see some disbelief. <laughs> Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Now I have to go through all the silly pictures again. <laughs> so that's what the rock is. The rock is a person that dug down to the foundation and built his life on the sayings of Jesus and did them. Just so you don't miss that, that little curve. So building your house on the rock... That's how you know that the house isn't going to go anywhere. In fact, we have building codes for a reason. Although a lot of the houses down the shore don't do that because they actually build them on sand. And they'll make what's called a monolithic, anyway. They make one big foundation that just kind of sits on the sand. But what happens is when it rains or you get a flood and the water goes underneath that foundation, all that weight from the house that was once distributed nicely over the sand is now unevenly distributed and creates a sinkhole in your house because it's not founded on the rock. But down the shore, you can't dig deep enough to get to the rock because it's all sand. So, which leads us to another building issue. Don't build on the sand. <laughs> Don't build in a floodplain. Don't build on the side of a hill that has a great view, but it's made out of mud. Now, these are things that people should know. This is things that great engineers should take care of. You can build your house on a rock or you can build your house in a rock it will be stable and won't go anywhere. And there are places where you can build your house that are susceptible to fault lines and that kind of thing. And then there are places that you can build in the midst of the most tumultuous sea and they don't go anywhere. Uh, I, I find lighthouses to be quite fascinating because they've been there for a long time. Well, at least in America, we think it's a long time. You go to Europe and it's like nothing. They're, they're like condos or something. Building your house on the rock means doing what Jesus says. Not just knowing about Jesus, not having a mindful of scriptures, not being able to rattle off the, the passage from memory. It's about doing it, which is a far different thing from knowing it, right? I mean, there's a lot of things I know. Fewer that I do. I love some of these old places like in Europe, like these giant castles. Guess what? They're built on a rock. You know why? Because they're still here. You're not talking about something that's just a couple hundred years old. You're talking about something that's thousands of years old, like back to the medieval times. I mean, that's, that's built well, okay? Not only did they build it on the rock, but they built it of rock. And some of these places, this is actually in Germany. I mean, I can't imagine just even cleaning that place. I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't live there. But there are some absolutely beautiful places and they still exist and they still exist because they're built right. If you want your life to be built right and if you want it to last, build it on the rock, which is doing what Jesus said, not just knowing it. I'm always fascinated by lighthouses. I think they're a great picture of uh, who we're to be in the world actually. Uh, always a warning and a guide for people. It's interesting because Jesus says this, the man who dug deep and he laid his foundation on the rock, that tells me that there's some effort involved. A foundation on the rock. And when the flood, or, flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, could not shake it because it was founded on a rock. Notice that the man who builds his house on the rock still has trouble, still has storms, still has a stream that beats on his house. So anybody that tells you otherwise is lying to you or they're trying to sell you something. Because these lighthouses, I, I find amazing because some of these pictures will show they put up with an incredible beating of the ocean, something that you and I would never be able to do if we just tried to stand there. It wouldn't work. Or if you build something out of wood, it wouldn't work. Or if you tried putting something on the sand, it just wouldn't stand. But these lighthouses take a beating from the ocean and they stay fastened. That is the picture of somebody who does what Jesus says. Somebody who's based on the work of Jesus Christ and the words of Jesus Christ. Which is why I hope you guys are here today to hear some more of this. Because that's what you want to build your life on. But he who heard and did nothing 
By the way, doing nothing is making a decision. Did you know that? Doing nothing is making a decision. You've done something if you've done nothing. He who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Like this lovely house built on a dirt hill in California. They have mudslides all the time. It's like common because, oh, what a beautiful view. Let's build a house right here. You can't go deep enough because it's dirt. And the stream beat up against this house because it was built on a floodplain and it fell. I bet you if it was based on the rock and it was made out of stone, it would have had another, another difference. And people spend their entire lives building upon sand, building upon principles and understandings and priorities that are not of God and their lives fall apart and then they wonder why. Well, you didn't build your house on the, on the foundation of Jesus Christ and what he said. Oh, you're just saying it because you're a pastor. No, I'm not. That's what Jesus said. And I believe it. Now, you may have experienced some difficulty in your life, some hardship. Don't be surprised, as though some strange thing were happening to you. It's going to rain on the well-built house and on the non-well-built house. The only difference is, are you going to do what Jesus says and build your house on what he says, or are you not? We all have that freedom of choice, don't we? We have that freedom to do what we want to do. It's our life, at least until it's over. And some people spend millions of dollars and they don't invest in a good foundation. And there are people that at the end of their life wonder what life is really all about. Because what have they been building on? And suddenly everything begins to fall apart. The ultimate storm in this story is death. And death is something that we're all going to have to encounter. Uh, whether you believe in it or not, it's still a fact. And it's true that 10 out of every 10 people die. Unless the Lord comes and takes us home, which could happen. John Paul Getty, one of the most wealthy people in our history here in America, he was a miser. He could not come to parting with a couple dollars to buy lunch. And so he bagged his lunch. And, but he didn't do it because he thought it was a good idea or because he got to choose organic ingredients or anything of that nature. He did it because he was so cheap he couldn't part with a couple dollars. Wealthy beyond belief. So what's his foundation? Money. Having money is the most important thing and I can't spend it even on myself. So how much do you think he's given away? <laughs> William Randolph Hearst, another incredibly wealthy man in our country, he forbid the word death to be spoken in his house. He forbid all of his waiting staff, all of his servants, his chauffeur, all of them. None of them could say the word death. It was, you, you would get fired immediately. But guess what? It didn't stop it. It didn't stop death from finding him because he didn't want to think about it. Howard Hughes, you might know something of him. Uh, the, the, the movie Aviator was made not long ago and talks about his life. And you get to see kind of a window, at least a, a Hollywood window, into what was going on in his head and his heart. Um, wanting to make the, the biggest plane, wanting to renovate this entire industry and, you know, all the things that he wanted to do. He died in fear. He was a germaphobe and he was basically insane at the end of his life. What was he building his life on? And you know, there are people that would say he had everything. People that say, you know, he's an innovator. He, he you know, he went as far as he could with, with all that he'd been given and he did more than other people did. And, you know, he was able to speak confidently before Congress and, you know, all of this stuff, he seemed to have it all together, but in the end he lost it. He didn't build his house on the rock. And Hugh Hefner, I find it amazing that Hugh Hefner died, not that part, but that he left his money to all the women that he abused <laughs> and that he used. I think that's ironic. Because what are you basing your life on? If it's about yourself, if it's about enjoyment, if it's about happiness, you will never be happy. Never. 
You'll be chasing it like a carrot out in front of a donkey. I mean, it just, it, you never find enough because we have a God-shaped hole that only Jesus Christ can fill. Amen. So, what kind of fruit is seen in your life? And are you a person who is a doer of the word of God? I think that boils down everything that Jesus said in this section. In Psalm 127, it says this, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In vain you rise up early, you sit up late, and you eat the bread of sorrows. But, and so, he gives his beloved sleep. Listen, you might be about working and striving and making goals and saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And You know what? Unless the Lord's doing the work and unless you're a good tree, you're not going to produce any good fruit, anything that's lasting. And so, I ask myself, am I a good tree or a bad tree? I'm a good tree because Jesus makes me a good tree. Because he gave me a new heart and a new mind and he put his spirit inside of me. And because I don't do the things that I once did, I do those things that please the Father and it gives me joy to do so. Those are all evidences that God has done a work in my life. That's one of the greatest miracles I can attest to is what he's done in my life. I hope your testimony is exactly the same. That God has done a work in your heart where there's fruit just just coming out of you because you're, you're his conduit to bless other people and to point people to Jesus. And that's what every one of our lives is about. It's not just Pastor Dave. That's every one of us right. to live up to our fullest potential. And yet I understand that Jesus says, I'm the, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And he says, any branch in me that bears fruit, I prune it. So there are going to be things that you've got to cut out of your life for you to bear more fruit. There are things that need to be done. And anybody who doesn't produce fruit gets cut down and thrown into the fire. And Jesus is referring metaphorically and literally to a place which was never designed for human beings. And yet that's where we'll end up. So are you a good tree or a bad tree? You never see trees trying to force out some fruit. You don't see them uh, giving effort. It just happens. It just happens. Is it a natural thing for you to serve the Lord? Is it a natural thing for you to think of other people? Is it a natural thing? It can be if the Spirit of God is inside of you and he can inspire you to do such things.